Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ollie Nicholson. I'm from Unity. And um, today I'm going to be showing you a few bits and bobs, um, primarily um, surrounding the concept of getting your models into Unity and being able to build multiple platforms. So I'm just going to run a really quick video here, uh, part of our show reel. The um, Inbuilt speakers. Just to give a bit of an introduction. So, all for once, deploy anywhere. Basically, the concept that you bring together a project of all your assets, uh, manage that all together, and then you can output to a whole host of different platforms. I'll let the video do the talking for the rest of this one. Save my voice. Let's go to page one. So, 
an introduction, what I'm going to present. First of all, I'm going to probably uh, give myself some a bit more light, facing the sun. So, the challenge in visualising for real time. I'm going to look at the game's advantage. I'm going to talk about the Unity advantage. Practical scene building from Max exporting to a web build. So I'm going to actually go through the process of taking a, uh, a Max file and exporting an individual element of that into my project, building the project up and exporting so that you can actually launch a web build. Uh, prototyping and exporting uh, native files versus FBX, I'll have a little chat about that, and then taking things to wacky places. The kind of things that you can do uh, in Unity once you decide actually this is, you know, the world, um, the, um, you've got infinite combinations of things you can do when you take things out of reality. So, Unity, as I was explaining earlier, is an interactive development platform that's grown from games development. Private on its ease of use, um, we've got over 1.3 million users now who've, who've downloaded or interacted with Unity. Um, uh, up to about a quarter of them are using pro licenses, which include all the bells and whistles, things like real time reflections, lots of other stuff. All those kind of interesting bits and bobs you can find out from our website on the license comparison. Um, but it's really extensible, uh, and we've got a huge community of users through the Unity development, developer network. All of this is free to join, free to use. Uh, the whole bunch of resources for people that want to find scripts, shaders, tutorials, all sorts of ways of doing things, in addition to our asset store, which is like our in-game, uh, sorry, in-engine, um, um, effectively it's like an iTunes for game assets or interactive elements, scripts, any of that kind of stuff. So people can, people can actually develop their product and at the end of it they go, well that's cost me a lot of time to do that. And they might say, well I can get some of that time back by selling all the bits that I've created for my project back onto the asset store. That's quite an interesting uh, way to look at things. So, the real-time advantage. What is the advantage to visualising something in real time? Well, obviously it's interactive. Uh, video, you watch from begin to end, nothing said really. An interactive uh, environment allows you to explore the product, the environment, the architecture, whatever it is you want. Uh, in, a, in a way that you just obviously can't do with video. Uh, it's accessible. You can put these kind of interactive applications on the web, on phones, tablets, pretty much anywhere these days. And you've got an infinite number of possibilities from that one set of authored data, your Unity project. And of course, there's no on-demand rendering time and cost because you've built your project together, ready to be deployed to different platforms. The challenges of rendering versus something like web output are really the two extremes of visualization. If you think about a complex architectural project, uh, a client might ask to produce a video or an interactive run through of something, you're looking at using a very high end piece of PC hardware, for example. You might be looking to render a, a video sequence overnight, you know, for 8 to 12 hours or something like that. Um, you know, just for a, a number of frames for a video. Whereas an interactive, an interactive um, product requires that you render 30 frames a second effectively on a much lower uh, power, powered machine, such as a tablet or an iPhone or a, um, or a PC or a Mac. Um, so they really are the opposite extremes. A lot of people come to us and say, I've got this huge project, oh, can I just stick it on the iPhone? The short answer is no, you can't. But you can create something that looks like what you want it to be based on your source stuff. There's lots of, lots of processes you can use. And that's where you come to the games advantage. The games industry really has been born out of developing and optimizing graphical content for very specific platforms. Things like consoles, which had very specific graphics hardware. Things like uh, new mobile phones uh, hardware that have been coming along web platforms, specific PC or Mac or console requirements. So what's come out of that industry has been a lot of techniques uh, that you can use to apply to try and help a very big, complex and expensive rendering time project into something that's a bit more useful and uh, available on much lower spec hardware. So. Games Dev has required harnessing of that kind of specific hardware and squeezing every ounce of performance. 
some of the top methods for kind of working with these techniques are creating only what you need to see. This is obviously a great example of this at the moment. Make fences. If you can't see what's over the fence, don't worry about it. I'm just going to create a movie set for what I need to do. If you've got a, an entire city that can still be rendering behind a fence, because your camera may occasionally jump up a bit like that, then have a think about what you're actually doing. Likewise, if you're actually looking at um, your notepad, you can optimise meshes. You can think about ways of turning your very complex geometry into simply a set of boxes and lots of normal maps. Uh, obviously, a set of boxes is not a very interesting way of looking at things, but there's a whole suite of tools for optimising meshes in things like 3D Studio Max and Maya. You've got Pro Optimizer doing a pretty good job now. You've got third-party tools. So think about your target platform and what you want to output. Skyboxes, this is another good one. Why build a city when you can have a nice picture of one? So you can render what you want out to a nice skybox. Why would I need to render all those mountains as 3D geometry and um, uh, face me billboards sitting on the top of there when I can actually render out a pretty good picture once I'm behind the fence? So what I'm going to do for convenience is very quickly move my <coughs> So where were we? Navigate my way around. Normal maps, as I said, generate normal maps. If you've heard about normal maps, they're essentially a method of describing the surface of a mesh through a normal map rather than geometry. So it, it effectively uh, offsets the tangents of certain parts of your geometry to give the impression of much more complex geometry. It's a fairly common technique, most of you probably heard of it already, used in games, used in um, visualisation of all kinds. Um, light baking instead of dynamic lights, we're very excited about being able to put lots of dynamic lights in our scene, move things around, have moving shadows. If we um, take our sun here for example, got all that kind of interactivity going on. If I turn off my um, light maps, you can see all that stuff. And that's very exciting, but if you're having hundreds and hundreds of lights, all doing that kind of stuff, rendering real-time shadow, it's not the kind of thing you can work on with certain platforms. So it's good to have a think about what the alternatives are. And that includes things like light making. Um, Unity comes with a built-in light maker. Uh, called Beast, which is um, now in by Autodesk. It's a pretty good solution for many, for many, for many reasons. Mostly because it's fully integrated into Unity and can manage your lights. And then finally, another one: static reflection cue maps. Instead of if you can, if you can render exactly what's happening in that glass on the opposite side as a static image, why would you have to update that every 30 seconds? You don't really need to. You need to have a think about what you need and why. So this class has got a good example of having a static cube map where I've rendered effectively a cube map <coughs> looking in all directions and used that as a reflection map for this, uh, this class building here. So, where were we? The unity advantage. So, how does this apply? Basically, having an effective and easy to use workflow between your 3D packages and your ultimately your target platform is what the unit advantage is really. It's, it's what people say is its best features, how, how easy it is to use, to drag and drop in your assets, get them lit, have them light based and start visualising it quickly and simply. There's a number of different um, tools to help with these kind of things. We've got integrated now procedural textures. Um, algorithmic substances are effectively very small but clever algorithms that describe the texture information without it actually being a bitmap. But you can generate bitmaps from them. So the advantage of these includes um, the ability to very quickly generate lots of textures without lots of artists. So you can have tiling textures, you can have uh, bricks and all that sort of stuff. It's generally quite a lot of fiddly artwork sometimes to create. Um, and also, the other advantage is they're a very small footprint in memory size when you're downloading a web app, typically like 64K versus 512K or something like that for a, for a 5 o'clock texture. 
So native file support for direct import and prototyping. That's another very useful way of beginning to prototype your project. You can save your Max, your Maya, your Blender files directly into your project. And as you edit in Maya, Max, or Blender, and press save, it will update your Unity file, your Unity project for you immediately. And prefabs, and this is our technology for bringing together multiple elements that you've already set up in Unity in order to use again. So that might be a, uh, a model of a character that's got a camera attached to it, that follows it, and a script that tells you how to control it. And that would be a good example of a player prefab. So what I'm going to very quickly do now is I'm going to see how quickly it takes to knock up a scene like this. If I start with a new scene, I'm going to give you a really short guide around the interface if you've not seen it before. Effectively, over here you've got your project, um, you've got your project uh, browser. So I can look in here for all of my assets. Over here are the actual assets that are in these folders. So if I click on models, I can see here in my preview, There you go. So all my models I can preview in here. I can even preview multiple models by holding shift down. It's very handy. Um, and at the point at which I've got um, one item, or a pre even a prefab, I'm going to, in this case, drag terrain into my scene. So you can see this has got a bit of patchy grass on it already. So to say that I've completely created that from scratch now is a bit of a lie, because it's a prefab, and I've already painted out a bit of the grass there. But suffice to say, there's an entire terrain system built into Unity that will allow you to create this. I just don't want to waste the whole session showing you how to use just the terrain tools. So I pulled in um, the terrain there. I'm going to pull in a sun, or actually, I can actually create one from scratch <coughs> much easily. From game object, create other directional light. So that gives us the ability to Let's get some other items in. So if I go to 3D Studio Max, for example, I've got my architecture scene. Now, to begin with early days from a project, you might want to save this whole, fo this whole file into your Unity project. Now what that will allow you to do is to move verts about, mess about with different materials, whatever you can do, save very quickly, and then your Unity file will update. That's great for prototyping. But if you're building any kind of interactive uh, experience, you really need to treat your project in a modular fashion. For example, the interior, I've broken this whole project up into um, layers using 3D Studio layers. So if I hide the base, uh, the exterior, for example, I can see there's elements of this that I will need to collide with when my character wants to walk through the building. And there's elements of it that I won't. So I tend to divide my projects up into the elements that I wish to have collision attached to and the elements that I don't. Purely because if your, render, if your game engine is trying to collide with everything in your scene, you're going to cause a lot of um, slowdown in your performance because you don't want to be constantly calculating. So for example, steps. It can be quite expensive. One simple way to um, get around that is to literally create a flat collision mesh that can help you glide up. So I haven't got to literally think about colliding with every individual step and the little part and all the details. Likewise, I'm never going to need to collide with these roof bits. So once I've divided my, um, my setup into modular sections, for example, the exterior. I'm going to select everything from the exterior there, and I'm going to do File, Export, Selected, and I'm going to go into my Models folder. I'm going to call this Exterior 3, just so we can see it's fresh. Um, and that gives me my FBX Exporter dialog box. And when I go back to Unity, you can actually see very quickly uh, importing that one there. So what I'm going to do is 
that little error is turning into run crash service on my low mind crash server. We also have a facility which allows you to cache all the locally imported data so that when you are loading big projects, it already has the converted files for you. When you bring an FBX file into um, Unity, or if you bring a 3D Studio Max file, it will convert those in the background for you. If you're running a cache server, it will help you to uh, load your projects quicker because it will have that stuff cached locally for you. So, I'm just going to do that from the front side. So, back to my project, and if I go into models, I can see exterior 3 has popped up here. So, I can drag straight into my scene, or if I actually want to drag onto the origin, I can just drag it into my hierarchy here. So let's see where that is. At the moment, I might have to check that I've got the scaling matched to my other models. And in this case, I haven't. So I'm going to set that to 0 0.025. And that's the difference between scaling back from meters. Um, there's lots of different settings for this, depending on which package you're exporting from, which coordinate system you're working from, uh, which unit setup you've got in your 3D package. But suffice to say, there's a great bit of documentation that will allow you to basically set up what you need um, for a particular package you're using. So that's kind of looking in the right place to me. Um, so I have the beginnings of my building. And as you would probably hear on Blue Peter, here's a few I prepared earlier. Got the interior. So I'm going to drag the interior over. Let's pop that in there. Um, I've got a yard model, which is basically the, the surrounding fence and yard. I'll put that into my scene. You'll notice that the material from this one is missing. Now, that's because it's using one of the procedural materials that I've created, which you can actually set up in 3D Studio, but we're working on an import pipeline that can directly put that up. But in this case, I've set up this particular material with specific shaders in Unity. So I want to use that master material. So if I want to assign that, I can see in my inspector on the right hand side that right now on my materials tab here, I've got wood boarding, which is not the material I want. So I'm going to look for one called house underscore wall. And I'm going to drag that material onto there, like so. So that very quickly sets up the material that I wanted there. Um, I'm going to add a prefab light that's got all the right settings that I've already set up before from my um, prefabs folder. So, give us some direction that we really want. So, you can see that we've got the shadows turned on. Um, I want to also grab the glass and doors. But first things first, I want to bring in the sky dome. So the pre-prepared sky dome, which is essentially six photographs, front, side, back, up and down, um, put together in a sky dome. I can set on my um, render settings here, and I can pick the skybox material, and I can find my Algarve one that I created, which is actually generated from a 3D um, environment. So it is actually not just photographs, but it's effectively rendered out from that 3D environment. Um, so the other items we've got here are uh, non-collidable stuff, which goes in. The interior bits and bobs. We've got the uh, windows and doors. And of course, they're all now set up with pre-baked uh, static cube map, which gives you your nice reflections uh, coming in there. So, once you've got that, the first thing you obviously want to start doing is walking around your scene to have a look at it. Unity works with a scene uh, view and a game view. And a game view is essentially what you would see as your first person or third person or, or however you set up. So, the way you set up a, a character is you essentially you can import uh, a character package from here. So you can have there's a there's a ready-made, which is essentially a, um, a collision box, a camera, um, and a set of parameters for script so that you can control that character. So again, in Blue Peter fashion, I'm going to bring in our player here. So all of 
player is, is a series of controller scripts, uh, a camera, and a collision capsule. So if I'm lucky, I can press play now, and I'm literally dropped into the scene, first person style, and I can move around, and that's when I can actually start to get a feel for this building and what's going on here. So don't take this, this uh, version as this kind of final render, because there's things that we want to do, like bake light mapping, which I can show you where all the options are, but you know, you could need a good half an hour and hour to bake a light map from scratch. So again, I'll find a scene where I've done that already. Um, we might want to bring the um, trees into the uh, mix here. So let's see. Uh, there is a tree editor in Unity as well, so if you are a dab hand at uh, a bit of organic uh, procedural modelling, you can have a try at that. So we're starting to get the gist of our scene really quickly, straight out of 3D Studio into your scene. One of the first things you might want to do, obviously, would be add some interactivity. So the first task I would look to be thinking about doing might be to open the door so that my character, my first person view, can get into the building. Uh, so the way that I would do that is I would find a door that I can open. At the moment, you could just probably walk in because the door's not there, but people want to see interactivity. That's why you're doing a project in Unity. That's why you're making an interactive demo and not video. So if I go into my models, I might be able to find a particular door. Uh, and I might be able to find the front door. So at the moment, if I rotate that door, it's not really going to help me get in there. So what I'm going to very quickly do is I'm going to create a hinge joint, which is a pivot, essentially, around which I want the door to pivot. So I can create a cube. So at the moment, if I want to move that into place, I can hold B, and that will vertically snap to another object in that scene. Um, I'm going to scale that down a bit. And then I will place that in the location of the hinge of where I want this door to put it around. And um, then I very simply, let's name that door hinge. And then I will grab my front door parent it to door hinge. And at that point, if I rotate door hinge, we have the window in the right place. So the next stage is to actually create a trigger box so that when my player character walks into it, it triggers an animation to open up that um, door. So again, using a trusted cube, I will move that one in place. So we have a trigger box. This is going to be a bit bigger. I'm going to, uh, under the box collider, I'm going to pull up this trigger. And I'm going to turn off the mesh renderer so effectively it's invisible. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a sensible name like trigger in my hierarchy. So this section on the left. It shows what's in your scene. This section down here is obviously what's in your project, and that's what's in that folder of that project, just so you're sort of knowing your <coughs> way around there. So the next stage would be to write a script. Now, I'm not a scripter, and I'm a bit lazy, so even this script is pretty simple. But what you have is you have a door hinge, and you want it to play an animation on that one. So the first thing I would do is I would get my door hinge, and I would open up the animation window, I would push record, and I'd set a keyframe at the beginning, and a, a number of frames in. And that would very quickly give me an animation. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one that I've already done for it. So in my anims, I'm going to grab door open, and I'm going to put that on my door. So, then I need a script that tells it to play that animation. I'm going to turn off play automatically because I only want it to play when I'm in that trigger box. So I'm going to go into my scripts folder without going into too much detail. There is my play door script. It basically sets a public variable for animation.play and it does door open, plays that animation for me, uh, and then does some other scripty stuff afterwards. 
So if I now apply that to my door hinge on there, then obviously what I need to do is assign a script to the trigger that says when I walk into this trigger, I want it to play that door open animation. So I'm going to drag a door script onto that one, and then I'm going to drag my door hinge onto that exposed parameter for the door. This is the bit where I cross my fingers, and hopefully, if I walk over near, it opens the door. Now, the first thing I notice there is that you can still see the hinge cube. So a little cleanup I might do there would be to go and turn off the mesh renderer. So that shows how quickly you can put the scene together. Um, the next stage would obviously be going inside and to start talking about global illumination and bouncing some light around the scene. So your light mapping controls here have got a whole uh, raft of different settings, from number of bounces to quality based on the number of final gamma rays that you spread out throughout your scene. Uh, you're also able to set the resolution, which you can preview here. Um, if I uh, So that's currently set very high. So what I'm going to do, rather than bake an entire scene here, I'm going to load my scene which has an already baked uh, set up for you. <coughs> Save that. So there we go. And um, you can see the light map resolution. If I turn that off, you can see on my first pass of high quality job, I've got a fairly good um, bounce from the exterior lights coming in here, hitting the floorboards, bouncing around the kitchen, the reflections as well, uh, and outside, it's not looking too shabby either. Obviously, this is the kind of thing that just takes a lot of uh, trial and error to get the results you want. My best advice for light baking is to start with a, a really small number of final gather rays, get the amount of actual brightness that you want, even that ignore the sort of low resolution bounces, and then when you're really happy with the amount of light that's getting around, rather than the quality, you can then up the quality and you can you can start to render some um, uh, some really high res light map uh, light paper. So that's pretty much how you go. Then at the point at which you decide I want to do a preview build with this one, I can very simply go to my build settings. And this is the joy of uh, Unity really. As you can see from all these very exciting options down here, they're not all available straight out of the box, for example. We're in a process, you have to negotiate basically a uh, developer contract with some of the more specific consoles down the bottom there. But out of the box, you can build to web player, PC, Mac, Linux, um, and additionally with add ons, Android uh, and iOS. Uh, and you can also build to Flash Player and Google Native Client. Google Native Client essentially allows you to export a, uh, a web browser version without the customer having to download our plugin first because Google has it built in already. That's quite an advantage. So I'm picking the web player in this particular uh, example and I'm going to click Build and Run. I'm going to pick a place where I'm going to build it to. So let's go. then test, like final, then final. Okay, I'm going to select that folder. And what it will essentially do is it will do a bit of compression, it will put together and compile your player experience and make it a deliverable uh, web package that you can then host on the server for your clients to view if you're doing a work in progress. You can publish it as a finished product if that's what you're doing. And of course, once you've bought Unity, there are no after, after costs for licensing, for any of that kind of stuff. Your content is, your, is what, what you'd like to do with it, basically. It's, it's there for you to do as you will. Um, additionally, the kind of things that you can um, have a look at once, we, once we're building that one. Interior light balances are pretty, pretty good to uh, muck about with. I'm just going to... Uh, Um, and you, you're able to get some really, really nice details in the quality of the light, though. 
If it's still not doing what you want, or you have a specific setup in 3D Studio with V-Ray or any other renderer, you can also import those light maps. Um, you can also start to work with really wacky and wonderful environments and everything from sort of sci-fi or game-inspired stuff through to uh, fantasy strange lands or whatever. You don't have to set your visualization on Earth if you don't wish to. But that's kind of a bit of the game's angle coming in there. So we'll see how we're doing with our build. That's doing the compression bit. Let's take a little bit of time. Um, while it's doing that, I'm going to quickly open the floor to any questions, and then hopefully we'll have a web player built to uh, have a look at. Um, all the actions uh, would work on Android, the web player? Yes. There will be limitations um, on it, the output. It's um, not real time, obviously. It's baking a light mapping solution for you. Uh, and when you deploy that to the Android or the iOS platform, uh -huh. that is the kind of the recommended route that we we recommend you take because baked light mapping is going to be and we'll just reconnect to the internet um, uh, needs to be connected to the internet. Yeah, so essentially if you're um, outputting to Android, any of the light maps that you're building will be available to that deployment. Obviously, the, the joy of working with Unity is that you can specify the resolutions that you might want to output in four different platforms, but all from one project. Has anyone got a connection to this, one of these connections here? So I have tipped build for offline deployment, but if my um, Unity web player wants to just do a quick check for the latest version, then I need to be connected to the interwebs. Does anyone have a look? Uh, does weeks, but this is what you can see. You can come up with literally in half an hour from Max model through to exploring my building. Uh, I thank you very much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any more questions before I uh, have a brief rundown of the uh, four features? Yep. How do you develop the reflection cube maps? How do you do the reflection cube maps? Well, there's a number of ways. There's a script on our internal wiki. I say internal, it's available to anyone that accesses the internet uh, on our website. And what that script will do will allow you to place a, um, a marker in your scene that will then render out a view from each one and create a cube map for you. And it, there's two variations of that script. You drag that script into your project and you have a static version which will generate you a static cube map from anywhere in your scene. And then you've also got a real-time skew map, which will update that every 30th of a second, or however fast your frame rate is, in order to have real-time reflections. So if you Google uh, Unity and um, reflection script, you'll come up with that pretty high Next. Uh, 
It's not HTML5, it's our Unity 3D content plugin. Um, and that enabled, it's been around before HTML5 was kind of put up there. It's something we maintain. It's available to fairly <laughs> low impact download to anyone that uses it. If you're still worried about you know, downloads for uh, your clients, you can use the Google Native client. So you can build for Chrome without having to download a plugin. But it's not HTML5. I was just wondering, is it possible to um, provide like hotspots so you can have a low poly version? Click a button and return to that high res render that you've done previously. Yes, yeah, so you could, yeah, you're talking about a kind of integrating yeah. HTML with yeah. 3D content. Yeah. yeah, there's people that have done quite a lot of inventive things using the web plugin and integrating it into their site. A lot of people have it just as a separate 3D showcase for something, but there's a lot of flexibility into what you can build in here. We have GUI uh, systems built into Unity, uh, lots of tools that you can use on the asset store as well. <coughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, how important is UV mapping in relation to cube, the uh, light mapping? Do we have to, everything have to be UV mapped? If you, really well? if you if you import any mesh, you can tick a box, uh, basically in Unity here, where it will generate light map UVs for you, which is very handy. So if I go into my models and pick exterior three, you can see here there's a generate light mapping UV tick box. So when I were to get around to doing some light mapping on this one, I'd have to tick that box and apply it. But you can import your own light mapping UVs as well. You can import up to two UV channels into Unity. Any more? I know you didn't kind of show this, but the collision, have any of us seen it? It's generally seen in Unity. Can you sort of do the that to bring through? Yes, that's another handy tick box just here. The generate colliders tick box. So any mesh that you will import, you can choose whether it generates its own mesh collision or not. If you want to be optimizing things, you tend to turn that off and bring in um, what I was showing from here earlier, which would be your ramp that you created that's lower, lower poly. So yes, you can, you can generate any collision mesh you like. So with Mechanim and all the other exciting features of 4.0, what we've basically tried to deliver, if I just join the website, um, is a new suite of tools for people that are not just creating games, but wanting to use much more complex animation um, features. And that basically allows you to blend your animations between, uh, for example, a run and a walk, and a, a, a walk and a somersault and a jump, whatever. And that, that comes under the guise of mechanism. It's a state machine as well, so it understands what states your animations are playing at and does some really clever stuff. And we have a whole bunch of animations that you can buy off the asset store to work with that, or animations you can download for free to try it out with. There's a bunch of DirectX 11 rendering uh, improvements, so there's cool, lots of cool image effects and stuff that you can have a play without with. with. Um, there's mobile um, optimizations, direct, uh, dynamic shadows, directional lights, that kind of stuff that we've improved. Uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff right into the particle systems, the rendering performance, output to Linux platform as well now. Um, but as I say, have a look, click and download, give it a try. Thanks very much.